from St. Paul's and welcome to another drive-in or sit-in or whatever we have outdoors in the beautiful creation of God for our church this morning. We're going to be declaring what a mighty God we serve. Let's do it. the worship this morning comes from Psalm chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. May the Lord answer you when you are distressed. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offering. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now I know this. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness and the grace that you have shown to us. You are a generous God, and we praise you for the way that you care for us, the way that you look after our requests. Lord, we pray that we might praise you this morning for that. We pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. And now... As a people who have received generously the grace and faithfulness of God, I also extend to you this blessing. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for your presence here today. And we're so thankful that you have come and you have given us everything that we need here on earth and that you are truly our only need. If we have your power in our lives and we have your strength, you are our reward and you are enough. In Jesus' name we pray.
reading this morning comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in the latter half of verse 2 and continuing through verse 19. 1 Timothy chapter 6, the latter half of verse 2 and continuing through verse 19. And the word of the Lord reads, These are the things that you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this commandment without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in an unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I'd rather have Jesus than
Let us lift our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we are so grateful for your presence among us as we have gathered here in your beautiful creation to worship you. Lord, we thank you for this, your good creation, for the very gift of life itself that has brought us here today. But Lord, we also know that there are many among us and in our communities that are hurting, that have experienced pain and sorrow. Lord, we lift up to you, Linda, as she recovers from knee surgery. We ask that you would continue to bring her healing. We pray also for Emily, who is in the hospital with COVID. We ask that you would bring your healing touch to her and to her family. We ask that as we lift them up to you, they would know your presence and your healing touch. Lord, there are many other requests that have burdened our hearts here this morning. And so we take this moment to lift those up to you now. Lord, we thank you for being a God of healing and of restoration. We ask that you would continue to be at work in and through us to bring about your healing and restoration. May your wholeness and your peace cover the sun. Lord, forgive us for those ways when we have not trusted you, when we have turned aside from following you, when in spite of our declaration that we would rather have you, we have turned aside after other things. Lord, have mercy on us. Help us to be a people who faithfully follow in the way of Jesus, our crucified and resurrected Lord. Help us to be a people of gratitude and of compassion. And so, Lord, we pray as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are so thankful for this time spent in the presence of the Lord this far this morning. And we are looking forward to turning to God's word in just a moment. I do want to make you aware of just a few announcements of things upcoming in the life of St. Paul's over these next few weeks. Uh, the first announcement is that the annual reports from our ministry leaders are due today. I'm hoping to put those together in a booklet for our annual meeting next Sunday. So if you are a ministry leader, that would include the pastoral staff, church board secretary, uh, treasurer, SDMI, NYI, NMI, uh, children's director. I've already gotten some of those, and if I've gotten yours, I really appreciate it. If I haven't gotten yours, if I could get those as soon as possible, that would be great. Uh, tomorrow night, June 7th, we are going to have a young adult small group at 6.30 at Pastor Daniel and Pastor Colleen's home. We are really looking forward to gathering there. So if you are a young adult, we'd love to invite you. If you do need their address, please contact us and we'd love to get that to you. Tuesday, June 8th is going to be our June board meeting at 6 p.m. over Zoom. So if you are have been elected to the church board for the 2021-2022 church year, our first board meeting together will be this Tuesday, June 8th at 6 p.m. 
This Wednesday, June 9th, we are going to be continuing the Creation Psalms Bible Study that is led by Kelly Prince. Uh, this Wednesday at 6.30, we're going to be gathering here at the church. We had a great group this last Wednesday. We'd love to have even more gather this coming Wednesday. Um, it's a fantastic study that we're going through as we study the Creation Psalms. So we invite you to be here for that. On Sunday, uh, next Sunday, June 13th, we are going to be celebrating our annual meeting Sunday during our morning worship time. Uh, this is going to be a time when we look back over the last year and celebrate God's faithfulness and God's goodness to us, as well as recognize several of our ministry leaders here in the church and thank them for their faithful service. So we would love for you to be here next Sunday for our annual meeting Sunday. Saturday, June 26th, there's going to be a youth party at Pastor Colleen and Pastor Daniel's home. That's going to be from 6 to 8.30. So if you are a teen, we would love to have you there for that. That's going to be a wonderful time together. And then camps are upcoming. It's hard to believe it's already that time, but our 6th through 8th grade camp is coming up at the end of this month. That's going to be June 28th through July 2nd. And we have three students attending this camp. So we would invite all of you to be praying for these students in preparation for them attending that God might work in their lives in powerful ways. Now I'm going to invite Miss Amber and Pastor Colleen to come up. Miss Amber has a really wonderful week ahead of her. She is going to be attending what is called the call at Mid America Nazarene University, and it is for high school students who are discerning a call to ministry. And so there's going to be times of teaching and group work, um, and we are just so excited. Uh, you had to be chosen for this. You had to send in an application and you had to be chosen. And Amber was one of the high school students chosen for this. And so we are so eager with anticipation of what God is going to do in your life. And we just want to spend a moment praying over you this morning. And so Pastor Colleen has come up to pray over Amber. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Amber and for her desire to follow you. Lord, we pray that this week, she might draw closer to you, that you might speak to her, that you might lead her and guide her as she discerns this call in her life. Lord, we pray that you would bring together many friends that would support her and mentors that can help her as she begins this journey. And we pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. good morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As always, it's good to be with you this Sunday. <clears throat> it's a beautiful day. Nice that the sun peaked out a little bit. Hear the birds singing God's praise in the background. That's nice. I, I don't know if you saw this, but there was actually a deer over here. <clears throat> Lorraine pointed out and wanted our kids to see it. Uh, I'm definitely counting that as a, a new attendee. <laughs> so it's good. Good to be out in creation. Our text comes from the book of Acts, chapter 5. It's a familiar story. It's a hard story. But we're going to read verses 1 through 11. But a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's knowledge. He kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard of it. The young men came and wrapped up his body, then carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead, so they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church 
and all who heard these things. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to thank God for that one, right? Uh, anytime you've probably heard this text preached, it's probably sounded something like this. Ananias and Sapphira had uh, tithed, but they didn't tithe everything that they were supposed to. And look what happens when you don't tithe. <laughs> now, I mean, I'm not going to complain that tithing is not an important part of the life of the church. Uh, tithing is the way that we uh, gather our funds together and resource the church and that we think together what it means to live generous lives together, that our resources do matter. I, I won't say that tithing's unimportant, but I don't think tithing is really what is at issue here. Don't hear me say that tithing isn't important. <laughs> but this isn't the primary focus of this particular text. In fact, if you go back, uh, there's a story, and, and it's uh, at least some commentators believe that this may be in mind. Uh, there's the story of Joshua and Achan. Joshua had won this great battle, but right before the battle, he told all of his soldiers, all of the people of Israel, that when they win the battle, everything that was taken, the plunder that was taken, everything, cattle, riches, anything, Anything that was taken in the battle was to be designated for God's own use and not the community. There was other times where the community had been able to take some of the spoils, but not in this particular case. All of it was designated for God's purposes. Now, Achan saw that there was a lot of good stuff, and he decided that kind of under the cover of dark, uh, when nobody was looking, he would take some of that for himself and hide it in his tent. Unfortunately, what begins to break out are all these sort of plagues. There's a disaster that starts happening uh, against Israel, and they figure out somebody took stuff they weren't supposed to take. And they start casting lots until it gets down to Achan, and Achan finally, under the pressure that he's been found out, says, yes, I took it. And he's struck down. He's struck dead. Maybe that story is lingering behind this one. Uh, taking that which does not belong to you, holding it for yourself, maybe so. But again, I want to suggest that there's more to it. If you were to read just prior to this story, and this is why it's important to read all of Scripture in its larger context, not just the isolated stories, you will find a story that's almost identical to the story of Ananias and Sapphira. But the results, the outcome, is very different. The story is one about Barnabas. Barnabas, that great name, he had his name changed to son of encouragement. That's just the kind of person he was. He had some land too, and he sells it. And he brings everything from that cell and lays it at the apostles' feet. And that's the end of the story. Nothing else happens. He's not praised for it. He's not condemned for it. Nothing happens. He just comes, brings all of it, lays it at the apostles' feet. You probably remember Becca talking a little bit last week about this community, this idealistic community in the story of Acts and how they had all things in common. Uh, this way of life in the Christian community is one of abundance, of a generosity that just seems to give and give and give. And that everybody has their needs met. There is nobody that has any sort of want. That doesn't mean that there's no poor within their community. It means that everybody has their needs met as it comes up. This incredible, beautiful picture. And Barnabas seems to be sort of the, the uh, paradigm, the image of what it means to lean into this type of community. He sells what he has and brings all of it to the apostles' feet to be used for the good of the community. He recognizes that he does not hold property by himself, that everything he belong that has belongs to God and therefore to God's people. What an incredible uh, view, almost difficult for us to kind of hold on to. I mean, we live in a society of private property. We live in a society where what happens with our own sort of pocketbook is our business and nobody else's. The Barnabas takes a very different sort of tact and brings everything to the feet of the apostles. Ananias and Sapphira have that same kind of storyline. They have some property. They go and sell it. But in the middle of selling it, 
Ananias gets this idea and he goes to his wife and says, what if, what if we brought not everything, but we acted like we brought everything and laid it at the apostles' feet. But we kept some of it back, back for ourselves, you know, just for a rainy day, just in case something goes wrong, just in case we have needs that need to be met. What if we keep this for ourselves? and not share it with the community. And of course, we know how the story goes. It doesn't end well. Uh, Peter figures out very quickly that Ananias has been lying to him. Ananias pretends that he has brought everything to the apostles and asks, wasn't it yours to begin with? Wasn't that your property before you sold it? Even after you sold it, all the money that you got, wasn't that yours to do with as you wanted? Why have you lied? And he dies. Sapphira, not knowing what happens, comes in a little bit later and does the exact same thing. Goes along with the story. She doesn't give up her husband in the lie. But in the meantime, she's caught in the lie. And they both die. Any suggestions for how I should finish this sermon? That's a tough text. It's a hard text. There can become a point where we begin to imagine that the world revolves around us. Sometimes as individuals, even as married couples, we can believe that the world revolves around us as a couple. That all of our lives, all of it is energized and focused towards this relationship. To the exclusion of relationships outside of of that covenantal relationship. When I'm uh, going through sometimes with a wedding, occasionally the married couple will want to do communion as part of the wedding ceremony. And it's a beautiful thing to do. There's something right and good about doing communion as part of this covenant ceremony in a wedding. But sometimes, usually, often, the kind of question that I get about communion is, can we not serve everybody else? Can we just serve us, the communion cup and the bread? Do you see what's wrong with that picture? Mm -hmm. This sacrament of the church that is given for the life of the entire church to be shared together in communion at the table of the one whose table it is. It's not even our table. It's the table of Jesus in which God invites all of us to come and partake of the very life of God. It is a sacrament for the whole community, not for isolated individuals, not even a couple. But they have taken this sacrament that was intended for the whole community and want to just keep it for themselves in that moment. Now, I don't imagine that it's malicious and intent most of the time. They're not necessarily thinking about it in those ways, but that's what's happening. They're taking something intended for the entire community and making it all about themselves. In our particular society, it's very easy for everything to be centered on us whether as single individuals or even as married couples, that everything revolves around us. But in this text, we are reminded that the married couple belongs to the church. The church doesn't belong to the married couple. There is a relationship in which everything is redefined within the church. Life in the church redefines all of our relationships in light of the way that Christ lives life with the church wedded together for the sake of all. There's this beautiful relationship, maybe I'll say it again, a beautiful relationship of Christ and the bride that is not just simply about Christ and the bride, but the whole world being brought into this covenantal relationship. And in as, in as much as any sort of marital relationship, any sort of coupling together of people fails to embody that kind of self-giving for others, it ceases to be a covenantal relationship that reflects the life of Christ in the world. 
And thus, even marriage can become an idol. That's some strong words. Now, keep in mind, I, I've only been married 10 years. Uh, maybe after this sermon, that will change. I don't know. I'm not saying that the marriage relationship isn't important. But sometimes we have given it such a status that everything else gets judged by that. And it becomes so all-important and all-consuming that all of our energies are given to that theme and it excludes the possibility of intimacy beyond that relationship. And by intimacy, I'm not talking about sex. That's a small and minor portion of intimacy. I'm talking about the kind of intimacy that is a self-giving, that is always available and willing to serve, that invites others into the hospitality of God, imaged in the table that we gather around in communion. Am I making sense? I hope so. I'm not disparaging marriage. I think it's a beautiful thing. <coughs> but so is singleness. Singleness becomes this coupling of people in the life of the church and with the life of Christ. And it can reflect just as much as any sort of marital couple, the life of Christ and his church. I mean, Paul was single after all. And we certainly venerate him as one of the great apostles. There's something beautiful about those who are single as well. They are not left out of the community. The problem with Ananias and Sapphira is that they believe their union, their coupling together, is the totality of all that matters to the detriment of the life of the church. They are willing to put their own relationship and needs up and against and over against the community. That's a detriment to their own relationship. In doing so, in taking that kind of posture that it's really about us and not being part of this larger thing, this larger family we call the church, they actually close themselves off from the life and grace of the Christian community. I'm not hearing a lot of amen, so maybe I'll just <laughs> keep uh, meddling. I don't want to say that marriage isn't a beautiful gift. It is. But we have to understand that marriage is about discipleship first and foremost. It's not even really about the couple. I mean, the couple are important, don't get me wrong. They take vows, they join their lives together, but they are being joined by a community and by God brought together for mutual edification. We call that discipleship. And if they should have children, they be then become the disciple makers for their children. In other words, they are to carry on the life of the church in that relationship, but not to the exclusion of not being part of this larger life of the church. Am I making sense? In other words, the goal of a marriage relationship is not that goal, that relationship in and of itself. That relationship, the goal for it, is the glory of God. The witnessing of Christ and his church and the union of God and all creation. That's the point. That's the point. Ananias and Sapphira have created an idol because they have taken an act of worship that is marriage and made it the object of worship. And we often do that, whether or not we're married, when we make everything about us. What do we get out of it? What's in this for us? How does this benefit me? And when we begin to talk about that kind of language, how does this benefit me? How do I become the center of everything that my needs need, or at least what I think they need? When that happens, we close ourselves off from the community. We isolate ourselves, and we often find that that desire, that, that need to hold on to stuff does not get smaller, but only grows and grows and grows. So that we are constantly holding on to our stuff 
we become increasingly selfish and isolated and turned in on ourselves, as Augustine would say. And when a mirror becomes turned in on itself, it ceases to reflect the very light of God back into the world. Can you imagine that? A mirror curved in on itself? When a relationship becomes curved in on itself, there's a whole lot of darkness that gets hidden in there. And the relationship itself becomes dysfunctional. For Ananias and Sapphira, it ends in death. It ends in destruction. They have cut themselves off from the very life of God by becoming a community that is enclosed in and of themselves. And having done that, death is the only natural outcome. Boy, that's a pick-me-up for a Sunday, isn't it? I don't say this to condemn anybody. I certainly don't say it to condemn marriage. Marriage is a beautiful, wonderful thing. But I do want us to hold it in the right perspective, that it is always in service to God and the church that we have these unions. And for those who never are married, they are no less part of this beautiful union of God and his church. They're not deficient. They're not somehow lacking. In fact, God has joined them. And in doing so, wherever God has joined us, we are made whole. Yeah, I know this sermon's probably not gonna be much of a pick me up. It'll probably be one of those that you really want to forget. But I think it's awfully important to be reminded that the whole purpose of the church is not to serve itself. The purpose of relationships isn't necessarily what we get out of it. And then sometimes the church itself has been guilty of taking that sort of tact with the world. Well, if we can get more people in, think of what we could get out of that. That might mean that the seats are filled, songs are a little bit louder, the plates are filled with money. Think of all that we could do. Think of all the ways that we might be served if we would just grow. This doesn't just go back to couples. This goes back to the life of the church. When the church becomes curved in on itself, like a mirror, it ceases to reflect the life of God, the light of God back into the world, back into the community. Ananias and Sapphira are a bad example. If Barnabas is a good example of what it means to live in Christian community, Ananias and Sapphira come right after and say, well, this isn't how you do it. <laughs> we have these two contrasting images. Barnabas, whose life is one of constant generosity, of seeking the good of others. Is it risky? Yeah. But he trusts that God's own providence will give him what he needs. And he trusts that the fellowship of the Christian church, of the church itself, will provide for the needs that he has as he provides for the needs of others. This is the life of prayer. Oftentimes we pray to God that God would give us these things, but we never actually intend to act upon what God brings in front of us. God, give me patience. That's the worst prayer, by the way, if you have children, because God doesn't just simply infuse patience into you. God gives you opportunity to practice patience. The life of prayer is one that we begin to listen to what God is doing and then join in with God as well in the act. If we pray that God would give us a heart for those who are impoverished, that doesn't just simply mean that we would have feel-good sorts of experiences in our heart. What God will do is bring those who are experiencing great need and give you opportunities to fill that need. Maybe not by yourself, but together. If, if we're going to be a community that prays that we would reach the world, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to reach all around the world, necessarily, but God gives us an opportunity to reach the world that's right here in our neighborhood by having conversations, building relationships, doing the hard work of being present when people are grieving and mourning and suffering. 
to pray that God would give us these kinds of hearts is also to pray and say, God, I'm ready to serve however you would have me serve at any given moment. For Ananias and Sapphira, their prayer life has centered on themselves to such a degree that it becomes this all-consuming reality. Barnabas' prayer, I think I want to try to pray more often. God, give me a generous heart, a generous spirit that doesn't seek my own welfare and be benefit. But give me the same heart and compassion that Christ has demonstrated in his love for the church, who has joined his life with us, even when we didn't deserve it. Ananias and Sapphira have this calculus trying to figure out how they can preserve their own lives. And in doing so, they lose it. Barnabas doesn't try to preserve his life. And he gains it. That's the upside down way of the cross. It's the upside down way of the Christian community, the church. That we are a people of the cross. And therefore, as those who embody the life of Christ again and again in this world, we are called to embody that way of letting go, of emptying ourselves, and allowing ourselves to be a conduit, if I could say it that way, the means through which God works to touch a world desperately in need. Listen for just a moment. You hear the birds? The beautiful thing about birds is that they give their song freely without asking anything in return. And doesn't it say in scripture that God's eye is on the sparrow? The birds don't harvest and plant and yet God gives freely. And they give freely too. Maybe the church needs to be like some birds. Singing our songs of praise, living lives of generosity, knowing that that song goes out and it may, may not return anything to us. But it is a sign of God's glory at work in creation. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for the gift of Christ and that you have joined us in life. Even when we were yet sinners, when we were far apart from you, when we didn't deserve grace, when we were vehemently against who you called us to be, when we have fought you tooth and nail, yet you have come searching for us like that lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost child. You have come seeking us. And you have extended love and grace to us time and time again, though we did not deserve it. And even when we did not ask for it, you are a God of great generosity. And your love continues to overflow. May we as St. Paul's, as part of your church, allow that love to flow in and through us so that we might not become mirrors curved in on ourselves that cease to reflect your light and love out into the world. Unfold us, shatter us if need be, but may we not be like Ananias and Sapphira. And for the ways that we have, Lord, we ask that you would forgive us. For the ways that we have been greedy, the ways that we have been selfish, self-centered, Forgive us, transform our hearts, give us opportunities to practice what we preach so that we might be the hands and feet of Christ in our world, that we might love well and serve well as you have loved us, even to the point of death. 
Help us to be this, this kind of community that, that we hear about in Acts. Not just simply idealistic, but yet faithfully trying to embody the way of Christ in our world time and again. Help us to be like a Barnabas, that we might be those who encourage by our giving, by our serving, by our loving, by our forgiving, by our mercy, because we know how much we have been forgiven, how much we have received mercy from you. And so this day, we ask that you would transform our hearts and lives so that we might serve you perfectly and glorify your name in all ways. In Christ's name, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Church, if you would stand to receive this benediction. May the peace of Christ be with you. To give you peace that goes beyond the fear that we often feel. That begins to pull us into our own selves and to focus only on ourselves. Now that, may that same peace draw us out to embody the life of Christ for the sake of the world. May we go singing his praise together. Praise God from me.